So welcome to the welcome service for Lisa, um, coming to join us in the Sheffield circuit as co-superintendent. So we be quiet for a moment. As we are scattered, so we meet. We meet with one mind in soul and in spirit. And in the spirit of truth and life, we come to worship God. The God of love with us, the eternal creator. The God of love with us, the revealing son the God of love with us, the empowering spirit. And so we sing together the Church of Christ in every age. So we continue with the liturgy and there is a response and the response is again we turn to you. Loving God you call your people again and again to new beginnings and again we turn to you. We remember that when the earth was new you made life in all its beauty and diversity. Again, we turn to you. When we least expected it, you came in the form of a newborn child, turning expectations upside down. Again, we turn to you. Then, surrounded by unexpected ones, outcasts, thieves, anxious rulers and silent friends, you took upon yourself the burden of the whole world's pain, suffering death upon the cross. Again, we turn to you. Then early in the morning, 
attended by women bearing burial spices. You made your resurrection known, coming back to those and for those who had run from, despised and denied you. Again, we turn to you. So again today, in the multicoloured, always diverse expression of your church, so we come. Bring to us renewed life, renewed hope, renewed love. Forgive us when we have wounded, heal us when we have feel hurt, soften us when we are hard-hearted, free us when we have become prisoners even of ourselves. Set us free in the life, love and joy of your spirit, we pray. To all, God comes, setting us free to love and serve, to live afresh again. Thanks be to God. And so we hear our scripture readings. I invite you, Jonathan. Reading from Joshua chapter 3, verses 1 to 17. The next morning, Joshua and all the people of Israel got up early, left the camp at Acacia, and went to the Jordan, where they camped while waiting to cross it. Three days later, the leaders went through the camp and said to the people, When you see the priests carrying the covenant box of the Lord your God, break camp and follow them. You have never been here before, so they will show you the way to go. But do not get near the covenant box. Stay about a kilometre behind it. Joshua said to the people, Purify yourselves, because tomorrow the Lord will perform miracles among you. Then he told the priests to take the covenant box and go with it ahead of the people. They did as he said. The Lord said to Joshua, What I do today will make all the people of Israel begin to honour you as a great man, and they will realise that I am with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priests carrying the covenant box that when they reach the river, they must wade in and stand near the bank. Then Joshua said to the people, Come here and listen to what the Lord your God has to say. As you advance, you will surely drive out the Canaanites, the Hittites and the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites and the Jebusites, you will know that the living God is among you when the covenant box of the Lord of all the earth crosses the Jordan ahead of you. Now choose twelve men, one from each of the tribes of Israel. When the priests who carry the covenant box of the Lord of all the earth put their feet in the water, the Jordan will stop flowing and the water coming downstream will pile up in one place. It was harvest time and the river was in flood. When the river left the camp to cross the Jordan, the priests went ahead of them, carrying the covenant box. As soon as the priests stepped into the river, the water stopped flowing and piled up, far upstream at Adam, the city beside Zerathon. The flow downstream to the Dead Sea was completely cut off and the people were able to cross over near Jericho. While the people walked across on dry ground, the priest carrying the Lord's covenant box stood on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan until all the people had crossed over. This is word of the Lord. The readings taken from Hebrews 12, 1 to 3. As for us, we have heard of this large crowd of witnesses round us, so then, let us rid ourselves of everything that gets in the way and of the sin which holds us, holds on to us so tightly. And let us run with determination the race that lies before us. Let us keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, 
on whom our faith depends from beginning to end. He did not give up because of the cross. On the contrary, because of the joy that was waiting for him. He thought nothing of the disgrace of dying on the cross. And he is now seated at the right hand side of God's throne. Think of what he went through, how he put up with so much hatred from sinners. So do not let yourselves become discouraged and give up. Last year when a successful stationing match was made between Lisa and this circuit, the leaders in this circuit would have known that at some point they needed to plan a welcome service. But that's no problem, is it? We know how to plan a welcome service. We know what the start of the connectional year feels like. We've done it so many times before. But everything has changed. The world doesn't feel familiar anymore. We're wearing face masks. Handshakes and hugs are no longer part of our everyday experience. Signs, instructions, and bottles of hand sanitizer greet us at every turn. We have to rethink our actions and our responses in almost every situation. We are in unfamiliar territory. In that scripture reading which we heard from Joshua, the Israelites had been wandering around for 40 years. They were in unfamiliar territory and they weren't sure what the future held. Their ancestors, of course, had come to the promised land and they'd failed to enter it. The opportunity had been there, but they'd backed away, being unsure of themselves and of God. Now a new generation has the same chance. Yes, they had been wandering in the wilderness all that time. Their food supply was manna from heaven, and they were led by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. For 40 years, they'd eaten the same meal and followed the same routine every day. But now they've arrived at a time and a place where God says it's time for a change. It's time to take hold of what I've promised and fulfill the purposes I have for you. But God also described the hurdles that they needed to overcome. He makes it plain that there will be enemies and obstacles along the way. But he also makes promises about assuring their victory. This is unfamiliar territory. And as the Israelites were reminded, you've not been here before. Or as it says in some translations of that passage, you have not passed this way before. Today, wherever we are, as we participate in this act of worship, we welcome Lisa, who has not passed this way before. This is a new appointment in a new part of the Methodist Connection amongst new faces. This is unfamiliar territory for you, Lisa. And there are some who would probably want to tell you that this is the promised land. You can make your own mind up about that. But that aside, there's no doubt that none of us have passed this way before. The manner in which we're sharing in this act of worship and the way in which we're called to be church at this time is unfamiliar to us. It's not what we would have imagined when that stationing match was made last year. So what is there for us to learn from the Israelites and how they responded to that unfamiliar territory? What help and guidance is here for those of us who have not passed this way before? Well, one of the first things that the Israelites were told to do was to keep their eyes on the Ark. The Ark of the Covenant, which they carried with them, represented God's presence. You may recall that God had told Moses to make this Ark. It was a simple wooden chest overlaid with gold and it measured 45 inches long, 27 inches wide and 27 inches tall and it was carried everywhere by the priests and the Levites. The Israelite people were told to keep a distance between them 
and the ark. Now, we know all about keeping our distance from others at the moment, don't we? But this was far more extreme than the two metres guidance that we've been given these days. The distance they were told to keep between them and the ark was a little over half a mile, or the equivalent of eight and a third football pitches, or about 900 metres, whichever one of those measurements you can imagine most easily. And it was very important that every eye be on the ark, so they would all know where to go. Now, we might believe that that sounds rather strange. We might wonder why they had to stay at such a distance from the ark. Well, religious historians would suggest that there were between two and three million Israelites wandering in the wilderness. And so you can imagine that if they followed too closely behind the ark, then only a very few people at the front of the crowd would actually be able to see it at any given time. Maintaining a longer distance from that ark made the ark more visible to more of the people. It was all about perspective. Added to that, the distance also reminded them of the awe that they should have for the presence of God which that ark represented. You may recall that when God appeared at Mount Sinai, he had warned the people about coming too close. The suggestion was that if God's presence was treated too casually, he would break out on them and his glory would be too much for them. We're told that the people then camped by the Jordan for three days before they moved on. And no doubt some of them wondered why on earth they weren't just getting on with it. Well, as that passage of scripture reminded us, it was springtime when the river waters were at their peak. The snow in the mountains was melting into the river and the spring rains were pouring down. So that mile wide river was raging and seeming to be absolutely impossible to cross. It seems as if God was encouraged them to wait so that they'd come to recognize and understand that they could not enter the promised land in their own strength. During those days, the people probably watched branches of trees being tossed around in the rapids and concluded that there was no way across that river. But as they discovered, God specializes in achieving what seems to us to be impossible. Some of the challenges that we face as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic may at the moment feel huge to us. How does Lisa begin her ministry here when she cannot physically meet us in the ways that we took for granted a while ago? How are we called to be church when we can't all be in our buildings at the same time or behave in them as we once did? How do we make an impact on our communities in this ever-changing scene? But perhaps looking at the impossibility of our situation is sometimes a necessary thing for us to do. Because as we do that, just like those Israelites, we find hope and encouragement in remembering that our God is able. The story of the Israelites being rescued from the Egyptians at the Red Sea had been told endlessly amongst the Israelite people. Now it's time for this generation of Israelites to experience God's power for themselves. So if things are looking more difficult and more challenging to us than we'd like them to be at the moment, the encouragement is for us to keep our eyes on God, to look for evidence of his presence and his activity and follow that. Keep things in perspective. Don't be tempted to rush ahead, but trust God's timing and God's ability to make the impossible possible. Secondly, when the time came to cross the Jordan, Joshua urged the people to sanctify themselves. Now, sanctify isn't a word that we hear much in our everyday conversation nowadays, but it means set apart or pure or holy. 
And in the context of this story, all of those things, in order that the Israelite people might be ready for what God was about to do. Remember, as I said before, that 40 years before, God had invited the Israelites to enter the Promised Land, but they were not ready. And so here Joshua is urging the people to ensure that their relationship with God was in a good place so that they'd be ready to receive all that God would give and handle all that God would do. Something was about to happen that would change everything. God would dry up the river, the Israelite people would cross over and life would never be the same again. There have been many momentous moments in the history of the world, in the history of our own nation and in our own lives when everything has changed in a moment and we have probably not been prepared for what came next. In this case, the Canaanites were happily living in the city of Jericho, surrounded by a strong wall and feeling very safe and sound, living life any way they pleased. And then when they didn't expect it, the walls came tumbling down and they were destroyed. Dramatic change doesn't come often, but history proves that it does happen. We have seen huge changes in how we're being called to live and how we're being called to be church in these recent months. And those changes have perhaps been more long-term than we thought they might be at the start of the pandemic and the lockdown. And there are probably more long-term implications ahead of us too. So if we are to respond appropriately and creatively and still effectively be church, We too must attend to our relationship with God. Stay close through prayer, the reading of scripture, worship, nature and conversation with other believers so we can listen carefully to what the Holy Spirit is saying or prompting within us. We may not use the language of sanctification, but these are the ways to be more prepared for all that lies ahead. And then thirdly and lastly, having prepared themselves, the Israelite people had to act. Imagine how those priests felt as they approached the river. What if nothing happens? What if they misheard God? Remember this river is a mile wide, it's muddy, it's flowing rapidly, and so stepping into it was a really brave thing to do. And as they step into it, nothing changes. It's only after they've gone some way that the depth of the water begins to reduce. And then when they reach the middle of the river, the flow of the water stops completely. The river dries up. The priests who are leading the way with the Ark of the Covenant stand their ground in the middle of the river and all the people cross over. I can imagine that the people thought their leaders were mad. But they'd listened to God and they demonstrated their faith by stepping into the water and staying put in the heart of the river until all the people had crossed over, until the job was done. The previous generation of Israelites had faced a similar decision 40 years earlier and they had turned back. All the same difficulties were still there this time around. The raging river, the enemies, the giants, the walled cities. But this generation of Israelites were willing to take the risk and be obedient to what they believed God was saying. They were willing to face the giants and step into the water. They were willing to leave behind the familiar and comfortable and really see what God might do. The situation we find ourselves in now may feel overwhelming and almost impossible to navigate. I don't know how Lisa is feeling as she comes amongst us and seeks with her family to settle into new surroundings and settle into her own leadership role in the circuit. I don't know how all of you are feeling about what lies ahead, but for all of us, this is a new season with new challenges 
but also with fantastic new and exciting opportunities. We have not passed this way before. So as we journey on, let's remember the Israelites. Let's keep our eyes fixed firmly on God so that we might have the right perspective. Let's give our attention to our relationship with God in Christ so that we're equipped by the Holy Spirit for whatever lies ahead. And let's commit ourselves to being obedient and persistent in that obedience, however strange or impossible it might seem. We're all in circumstances that we've not experienced before, and you, Lisa, are in a new context amongst new people. None of us have passed this way before. But God was a source of guidance, wisdom, and strength for the Israelite people, and he will be the same for us. These are challenging times, but I believe they are also exciting times for us to be the church. So let's not be afraid to dip our toe in the water and see what God might do. Amen. So Lisa, at this point in our worship, it's both my privilege and my responsibility to welcome you formally, uh, to present you to the members of this circuit, and to invite you through these promises to express your commitment to the ministry to which God has called you in this circuit. So sisters and brothers, I present to you Lisa Quarmby, who has been appointed by the conference to serve in this circuit. Lisa. Will you hold before us the story of God's love and mercy, above all the gospel of our Saviour Jesus Christ? And will you be among us as one who preaches the word of God, administers baptism, presides at the Lord's Supper, teaches the faith and cares for the flock? I will. I ask God to help me. I invite you to all join with me in proclaiming the gospel of life and hope. Through Christ, we have good news to share. Will you hold before us God's call to holy living and be among us as one who awakens the careless and strengthens the faithful? I will. I ask God to help me and I invite you all to join with me in commitment to the way of Christ. May we reveal Christ's way through our words and example. Will you hold before us God's commitment to human community, to our neighbourhoods and to all who live within them, and to the world that God has made? I will. I ask God to help me, and I invite you all to join with me in sharing God's all-embracing love. 
May we respond to Christ in all we meet. Lisa, in co-superintendent partnership with James and with Sally, to you is committed the responsibility for the life and work of this circuit. Will you, with them, and all your colleagues, lay and ordained, care for its people, inspire it to witness, and watch over its life in the name of Christ? I will. I ask God to help me and all to join with me in the building and equipping of the people of God in this place. We will join with you in the work of God, in the seeking of grace, in the ministry and mission of all Christ's people. Now I invite John, one of our circuit stewards, to come and welcome you also. Lisa. We welcome you to the work and the ministry in the Sheffield Circuit and I ask all both gathered and scattered to offer you friendship, support and prayers as we join together in this work. On behalf of everyone at Church of Christ in Darnall, I am very happy to welcome Lisa and young, and young family to Sheffield and especially to Darnell. I am sure Lisa will help us to show us the way forward in Darnell and carry on the good work Phil started. Let God's love be with you and your family always. It is my pleasure to welcome Lisa and family on behalf of Victoria Church, Stafford Road. We are a friendly and welcoming congregation and can't wait to get to know you better. We look forward to working and worshipping with you. We hope your ministry is fulfilling for you and us as we strive to develop together what church is now and going forward. We pray God's blessing on you in the coming days. Remember your call. Support the weak, bind up the broken, gather in the outcast, welcome the stranger, seek the lost. These are words which are given to us at our ordination and surely they say everything which we are about as ministers. And for me they say what I stand for as I come to the Sheffield Circuit to remember my call to you, to support those who feel weak in whichever way that may be. And we're mindful of these times that many people are facing great difficulties. To bind up the broken. I'm reminded of Jesus coming with hands that have wounds. The wounded healer comes and heals in our brokenness. Gather in the outcast. And I wonder how many of us at different times and different places have felt like the outcast. We feel outside of things. We don't quite fit in. We haven't got the right clothes or the right accent. And as you probably have noticed, that everybody else seems to be speaking really strangely in this circuit. And I'm the only one who's speaking the true language. But obviously, you're now looking at me thinking, what's she saying? Because I'm from the North East and I've got my own accent and you lot have got it all wrong. <laughs> but I'm sure I'll forgive you for that and you might forgive me as well on the way. Welcome the stranger. And there are many people out there who are strange. And I'm pretty normal, but you lot look strange. And you're probably looking at me now going, well, actually, you look a bit strange, Lisa, as well. Because we all are, aren't we? We're all a bit weird and a bit different and a bit odd. And that's okay. But what about those people who feel like a stranger, not welcomed within the life of the church, somehow feel beyond God's love? Surely for me, as a minister to you all in Sheffield, it's important that everybody feels that they're welcomed. To seek the lost. And sometimes we don't realise how lost we have become. We feel that like God has left us, or that God doesn't care, when in truth, 
God is right beside us, ready to carry us, ready to hold us up, but we've wandered away. And maybe in these times which are difficult, we feel like we've wandered away from the church because we're not in the building. But actually, God is always present with us. These are new times. We've never passed this way before, as Jill has said. So for me, it's an absolute joy to be with you all. I'm looking forward to meeting you all in socially distanced, safe ways. I'm looking forward to being able to wave at you when I pass on my tandem. And I won't be coming on my own because it's a tandem, so you'll see Andy as well. And he'll be pedalling at the front and I'll be pedalling at the back, I promise. And I just hope that even in these strange times, we get a real sense that we are all part of God's family and that I am part of that as you are. And I'd like to say that thank you for the massive welcome that we've already received.
to Jesus, the first and the last. We give praise for all that is past. We confess what has been said and done and trust him for all that is yet to come. So let us pray. Not for some future rapture filled day when somehow God will wipe all the tears and the fears away. Because that day is surely coming. But maybe it'll be through how we join in with what God's already and will be doing. So we pray to be the hands and feet and voice of Christ, entering darkness in order to share the light by walking humbly, living justly, and yes, showing mercy. Let's take the first step together. It doesn't matter if we're stumbling, for we are the body of Christ in this time and in this place, for this time and for this place in the heart of the city, with a heart for the city, in the urban and suburban, in the villages and towns and everywhere else around, in silent solidarity, in acts of justice shouting loudly. And maybe sometimes our prayer just simply needs to be, God help us to be the answer to prayer for somebody else. We're all part of this kingdom community united by God in our diversity. We each bring something to the feast of the Lord's table in this sacrament for all. No matter how able we think that we are, this love reaches so far and enough for all races and ages and abilities and sexualities to Jesus, the first and the last. We give praise for all that is past. We confess what has been said and done and we trust him for all that is yet to come. We give thanks for those who have helped us to get to here, for Phil and Tim. And as we look ahead and the next step of the journey begins, we pray for the churches in Great Ayton, for Lisa, Andy, Neve and Sam, for Darnell and Stafford Road as they continue what others began and as the Spirit continually calls us to the other, we find different ways and different places to be sisters and brothers. So, to Jesus, the first and the last, we praise and give praise for all that is past. We confess what has been said and done, and we trust him for all that is yet to come. So in whatever version or language is right for us, let us say together the prayer given by Jesus. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen.
So from where we are to where you need us, God of holy love, lead on. From the familiarity of what we once knew to the wonder of what you will reveal, Christ of holy love, lead on. To be transforming agents in the world and to be willing to be transformed. Spirit of holy love, lead on. We look with hope for good things and signs of the coming kingdom. Amen.